Hello lovelies, in this video Tim is going to be looking at ethical issues in psychology and how we can apply that knowledge for our I level exams. Now after you've watched this video and made all of your notes to help you remember everything that you need to remember over on my website there are loads of multiple choice questions just waiting for you. studies and experiments that we've already seen in psychology in earlier units have ethical problems. Milgram's work in 1963 involved the deliberate deception of participants. It also involved causing stress and anxiety to those participants. The Stanford Prison Experiment involved the causing of stress, depression and anxiety to participants. These are severe and significant ethical issues. Usually, the goals of professional psychology are noble helping us handle, treat and cure mental illness, helping us to improve the quality of our lives, helping to understand ourselves better, and helping us have healthy and happy relationships. Unfortunately, the methods used to try and achieve these goals are not and have not always been as noble. We can define ethics as the moral implications of our actions. Professional psychologists and researchers always try, therefore, to act in an ethical and moral way. The British Psychological Society, or BPS, is the professional body for psychologists and researchers. It has developed a set of ethical guidelines for research into psychology, effectively a set of rules that have to be followed when research is being carried out. The purpose of these guidelines is to ensure that participants and the public are protected against harm when research is being done. This is in a similar way to how there are guidelines for other sciences. In particular, the BPS is trying to avoid three things. Number one, deception, the deliberate and conscious misleading of participants, leading them to believe something which is not true, for example. Number two, non-consent. Participants must be able to give informed consent to the research. They must understand and consent to what is happening to them. And number three, psychological harm. Temporary or permanent physical or mental harm to participants is completely unacceptable and against the guidelines of the BPS. These three main things must be avoided, and that is what the BPS is attempting to avoid with the set of guidelines. Informed consent is the ability of participants to understand the research they are involved in and give consent to the research prior to it happening. BPS guidelines state that participants should always give informed consent to any research they are involved in if it is at all possible. This means that they should be told in advance the nature and aim of any research that they are involved in. They must also be made aware that they have a complete and total inalienable right to withdraw from the research at any time of their choosing regardless of where the research is at. If participants are under 16, then they are legally classified as children. Children are unable to legally give informed consent. In these particular cases, consent must be obtained from parents or guardians. Parents or guardians are also able to choose to withdraw the child at any time. Obviously, there is an issue with naturalistic observation. In these types of research, participants are observed in their natural environment. Consent is not usually given for this process, and it can't be obtained. If people knew they were being observed, that would alter their behaviour. This isn't a problem, provided that the participants are in a known public place. It would be completely normal for people to expect to be seen and observed in this type of environment, like a train station or supermarket, for example. Another way of reducing ethical issues in naturalistic observation is to get permission and informed consent to use the data after the observation has occurred. This is often known as retroactive informed consent. Informed consent must be total. Participants must be given all of the information about the entire research project, including methodology and aims. In 1973, a study by Menges found that this wasn't the case in 97% of cases. Deception is misleading participants. This is causing them to believe something which isn't true, or giving them deliberately false or incomplete information. If participants have been deceived at any point during research, then logically they can't have been given all the information about that research. They therefore cannot have given informed consent. Unfortunately, however, it is sometimes critically important to research that some information is held back from participants. Usually the reason behind this is to avoid that information biasing the results or affecting the behaviour of the participants. 
Let's take an example. Participants in a study regarding conformity might be more or less likely to conform if they knew one of their fellow participants was, in actual fact, a confederate. A confederate is somebody who appears to the participants to be one of them, but is in fact somebody working for the researcher with full knowledge of the experiment. The BPS states that deception is only ever allowed if there's a strong and definite scientific reason and purpose for it. It must be proved that there is absolutely no alternative to the deception and that the deception is needed for the study's results and conclusions to be valid and reliable. In addition to this, researchers must also ask random independent people if they would agree to the study after they've told them all the information. If they wouldn't, then the study can't proceed. Let's take an example. If this had been done in the 1970s and random independent people had been asked about the Stanford Prison Experiment, then they probably would have objected, especially to the levels of stress and anxiety caused to participants. This would have caused the SPE not to have been given the green light and it wouldn't have gone ahead. Participants can be given vague and general details about the study, but if too little information is given to them, or if it's too obviously vague, then participants might suspect they are being deceived. Obviously, deception is not a completely black and white issue. Some types of deception are very minor, for example the use of a leading question when examining eyewitness testimony. But others are very major. In Milgram's 1963 research, participants were deceived into thinking they were inflicting painful electric shocks onto an innocent victim. That is a major example of deception. Harm can come to participants in research in a variety of ways. There are two main ones physical harm to their person, or mental harm to their personality, short-term or long-term mental health. BPS guidelines state that the risk of harm to a participant in research must be no greater than it is in their everyday lives. Obviously, this is a very vague definition with very nebulous concepts, however. The risk to each of us in our everyday lives varies with ourselves and our personality, with our local environment, our chosen activities, hobbies and work. All of these things affect our daily risk. Some research in the past, as we've seen, has obviously involved the unethical and deliberate causing of harm to participants, though that sometimes has been for solid scientific reasons. Glass and Singer in 1972 used deliberately stress-causing noises to examine stress in participants. As a result of this, a great many of the participants felt depressed or anxious. A second example, and an obvious one, is Milgram's 1963 research. Many of the participants in this research suffered later extreme and lasting mental health problems. They believed that they had inflicted deliberate, painful, and possibly even fatal electric shocks on an innocent victim. A lot of them were debriefed properly, and they had to live with a lot of guilt. Some individuals lead lives with almost zero risk of any physical or mental harm. If they then go on to participate in any kind of research, they'll probably have an increased risk of harm. On the other hand, some individuals lead lives with a very high risk of physical or mental harm. Soldiers, vets, construction workers. The same research that would present an increased risk of harm to the previous group will present a decreased risk of harm to this group. Knowing what conditions would cause certain specific problems for certain specific people in advance is completely impossible. Researchers can only make every effort to minimise the risk of harm as they go along. This is another very good reason to do pilot studies. It allows these problems to be identified in advance. This is also one reason why participants have a complete and total right to withdraw from any research at any time. The risk of harm can therefore be minimised. Debriefing is a process which takes place after the research has been carried out and completed. In theory, and according to BPS guidelines, it is intended to return participants to the state of mental health they were in before the research began. Unfortunately and obviously, this is not always completely possible. If the research has caused serious and long-lasting mental health problems, then a quick single debrief afterwards will not be able to restore the participant to the precise state they were in before the research. In these cases, which fortunately are very rare, the participant will usually receive therapy or treatment. Often this is at the cost of the researcher or the institution they're working for. Debriefing is especially important if deception has been involved in the experiment. The debriefing session can clear up the deception and explain it, and it can also make the participant feel valued and informed, preventing further harm to their self-esteem or mental health. Debriefing 
must give the participant all the details of the experiment, what the method used was, what was actually being measured, the eventual aims of the research, and even what the results may end up showing. Debriefing must take place, therefore, as quickly as possible after the end of the research. This is to avoid and minimise harm, but there's also a practical reason. It helps to ensure all the participants can be contacted to debrief them. Also, during debriefing, participants have to be told that they have a complete and total right to withdraw in full all of the data they have contributed. If they're uncomfortable with it being used, they can have it removed. If large numbers of participants do this, it may mean that the study can't go ahead. A great deal of the research done in psychology obviously involves sensitive or personal topics, like our relationships, our attachment, our individual mental health and our personalities. Because of this, most people wouldn't want to be identified personally with their data. This might cause them embarrassment or self-esteem issues if they can be linked to a particular set of data. Therefore, BPS guidelines state that no single individual should be identifiable from the results and reports published after research has been done. General identification facts are completely acceptable, such as Mr X, a male office worker aged 24 who showed signs of aggressive behaviour. No single individual could be identified from these facts. Fully identifiable facts, however, are not. Mr Smith, who works in an office, lives on Ivy Tree Lane in Keithley, is aged 24 with brown hair and blue eyes and showed serious signs of aggression. The level of detail in that information narrows it down to one single identifiable individual. This would not be allowed. If it is not completely possible for reports and results to publish completely anonymous data, such as using a single case study of a unique individual who could be identified, then that individual must be told this in advance and they must be given the chance to refuse to participate or to withdraw their information. In some cases, a particular sample and method may generally identify a group of people, and specific individuals might be identifiable from their characteristics. If we take an example, a study carried out on second-year chemical engineering students at Glasgow University is anonymous, but it also narrows down the sample to an identifiable group. This is not necessarily a problem, as long as those involved have and are informed of their right to withdraw their data at any point. Sometimes, ethical issues in studies are completely unavoidable. If the participants in a piece of research are fully aware of every piece of information, then it's likely this may change their behaviour during the research. To take an example, if participants in conformity studies know that one of the other participants is a confederate, then they won't be influenced by them, and the results of the study will be invalid. Researchers, as we've seen, do have an ethical duty under the guidelines to minimise any deception that does take place. But some deception is sometimes a condition of the research. The research can't happen at all without some deception. In these cases, the magnitude and amount of deception, that's how often it happens and how much the deception constitutes, has to be minimised. This minimises the effect of deception on the participants. As you may imagine, some previous and past experiments would no longer be permitted today. Ethical guidelines and the social norms behind them have changed. An example is Milgram's 1963 research, and this is the usual example that's used when discussing ethical problems. This research involved very heavy deception at several points in the research, but the biggest one was that participants were deceived into thinking that they were genuinely causing physical pain and possible harm to an innocent victim. The participants were often left with very serious mental health problems as a result of the deception and what they believed the effect of their actions had been. Because of this, this study would be in no way permitted today. In a very similar way, getting informed consent is critical for ethical research, but getting this informed consent could bias the results and render the research itself completely invalid. As we've seen, participants are under observation are likely to behave very differently if they know that they're being watched and observed and that their behaviour is being recorded. If this is done in a public place where people expect to be observed anyway, then that ethical issue is avoided. Alternatively, consent can be gained after the observation has taken place and if people don't give consent, their data can be withdrawn. Both of these are ways of working around this unavoidable ethical issue. As we have already seen... Some areas of psychology involve research into the behaviour of animals. Two key areas where we've seen this are attachment and memory. 
Research by psychologists using animals is inevitably a subject of controversy and heated debate. On one side of the argument, some people argue that the research done using animals has provided us with a lot of valuable data, and that this data has helped us to understand human behaviour and thinking in a lot more detail than we otherwise would be able to. This argument also goes forward with the idea that lives have been helped, improved or even saved by the research done on animals in a similar way to how medical research involving animals can save lives. They argue that this makes the research morally justifiable. A further argument is that research can be done using animals that could never be done on humans. The research, for example, into attachment done using laboratory monkeys would never be permitted under any ethical guidelines or code today. However, because of this, many would argue that if research cannot morally be done using humans, then it can't morally be done using animals either. Unlike us, animals are completely unable to give any kind of informed consent to research. They never understand what is happening to them, and therefore, by default, they are always in some way being deceived. One issue is that, for research to be relevant, it needs to be conducted on animals with a roughly similar level of intelligence to humans, like monkeys or dogs. These animals are sentient, they have a sense of self, and they have a mental health status to consider. The research could cause them to suffer permanent psychological damage. On animals where this isn't the case, like whelks or jellyfish or insects where they aren't sentient, the differences between them and humans is so vast and unbridgeable that the research done has very little relevance to the behaviour of humans. As we've seen, there are ethical guidelines for psychological research which are set by professional bodies to help and guide researchers through the minefield of ethical problems and issues in research. That said, however, they can never make sure that every piece of research done is completely ethical all of the time. There are issues, and there are four main ones. The first is that unfortunately there will always be some individual psychologists who don't follow the guidelines. That said, however, these individuals or their institutions do leave themselves open to prosecution, or at least lawsuits. A second issue is that guidelines can be vague. The terms in them can be hard to define. Different people might have wildly different interpretations of what constitutes mental harm, or deception, or confidentiality. These are not terms which have a universal, specific meaning. A third issue is that there are cases where the potential benefits to wider society and medicine of research can possibly outweigh the ethical costs. For example, lives might be saved at the cost of deception to participants. It's impossible for anybody to objectively weigh up the ethical cost of research against the potential future benefits. Something which seems unethical now might save lives down the line. Fourthly, if a doctor conducts malpractice, for example, they can be struck off and then banned from further practice. At present, there's no such mechanism in place for psychologists, but they could be removed from their institution or fired and removed from the BPS, which will limit their ability to further practice.